。啊，下一位讲者呢，则是来自于纽西兰的 Richard。他们的东西叫做 Lumio， Lumio 这个东西很特别，是从二零一一年 Occupy Street Wall Street 的运动之后推出来的新的东西。现在在全世界有八十九个国家，像最近的香港也在使用这样的 application， 然后已经翻译成三十种语言了。跟刚刚的政党的东西不一样，他们是可以帮助你从。最小的 neighborhood 的决策到呃，威灵顿的市政府其实也在使用这样的软体，怎么样帮助更多的公民参与讨论，然后形成具体最后的政策？那我们就掌声欢迎我们的 Richard 来分享他们的经验。Thank you, thank you. Uh, 大家好。Um, I wanted to talk. Yeah, CL asked me to give a name for my talk, so I I chose some words that I'm excited about and I put them together and and th those are the words: open source tools for self-organizing democracy. And each of those words、uh, has a tremendous amount of meaning and and feeling behind them for me. So so open source, it's it's kind of a, a for me, it's like a code word for free software. And free software is、um, it's about Well, it's free, isn't it?、Um, it lives in the commons. It's publicly owned, and and people are are producing it together and 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 donating it or, or giving it to the to the to the to society to use.、Um, and and it's free in the sense that anyone can participate in in creating it. And it's also free in the sense that it is designed to increase people's freedoms. And those three aspects, I think.、Um, uh, Bill, when we, you know, when we're thinking about the, the future of governance and the future of democracy, those three principles I think are pretty exciting.、Um, the second bit, tools. So I'm an engineer, and I get very excited about tools and and the potential of new technologies for shifting collective behaviours,、uh, hopefully for the better. And I guess I'm a little bit wary、um, at the same time of of getting too focused on the tools and 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 having this idea that if we just had the right technology. Then all of our political problems and our social problems and our cultural problems would be fixed. And、uh, I think it's really important that our tools are, are animated by by humans. You know, they're animated by、um, emotion and politics and culture and empathy and love. And an engineering solution is only part of、uh, one part, one little segment.、Um, the next bit, self-organizing. So all of the people that I like to talk to and all the movements that I'm excited about, they all use that word self-organizing, and it's a Um, it's a distracting word on its own because I mean I think it means self-organizing means that that the the group is organized by the people that are in it. You know that there's not someone outside of the group that's organizing it. It doesn't mean that it organizes itself. There are still people that have to do the organizing work, and it's very important、um, that those organizers are are visible so that they can be held to account and also that they can be supported effectively to work well. Um, and that last word, democracy, I've heard it a lot already in the last、uh, couple of days that I've been here in Taipei. And、um, usually, when people say democracy, they're thinking about a system of government that operates at a state level, and it's an institution, and and there's a very formalised process of interacting with it. And、um, I, I don't mean to offend anyone, but that kind of democracy is very boring to me. And what I'm actually excited about is is the kind of democracy that happens on a day-to-day -day basis. That is a Uh, a habit, a skill, a practice that、um, is between me and you, and and the way that I relate to you, and the way that I、um, listen to your experience and your opinion and your perspective, and respect that it's different from mine, and then look for for shared agreement between out of that diversity. That is the kind of democracy that I'm excited about, and that's、um, the work that I've been on. So, I wanted to just tell a little story about、um, what I've been up to for the last couple of years, the work that I've been doing. The experiences I've had, and then introduce Lumio, which is the software we've been working on, and then talk about Podemos, which are a group that have、um, been using Lumio extensively, and I think they've got some parallels、um, in their political movement with perhaps that、um, we could learn from here in Taiwan.、Um, and then I would like to sort of just quickly draw some parallels between all the different social movements. So I, I, I come from the Occupy movement, and prior to that, there was the Indignados movement. And then the Arab Spring, and and now of course we've got the Sunflower Movement and Occupy Central, and there's this ongoing wave of social movements. I think there have got some real coherence between between them, and I'd like to see if I can draw some of that out. So、um, 
A, a little story about me. In 2008, I graduated with my engineering degree. Um, and as you might recall, 2008 was a very bad time to try and find a job. Um, I, I, was, I found myself in this position where I was, you know, I'd done all the right things, I'd gone to university and I'd tried very hard and I got good grades and I graduated and then there was no job for me. And as a result, I was, you know, I had to spend some time figuring out what am I, what am I going to do with my, myself as I'm unemployed. And I spent some of that time looking at um, what was going on in the world and the more um, educated and, and informed I became of what was going on in the world, the more depressed I became. Um, I've, uh, I, I look around the world and I see so many massive, complex challenges facing us, whether that's um, catastrophic climate change or it's ecosystem collapse or it's uh, perverted systems of government or it's our growing inequality between rich and poor. All of these issues that are so complex and so beyond the scope of what I could possibly do anything about and, and the, the consequence of, of learning about those things was that I was, I was incredibly depressed, I was disengaged, I was cynical, I was one of those apathetic young people um, that we like to read about in the newspaper all the time. And then in 2011, um, the Occupy movement took off in, in Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street, and I saw some images coming through my Facebook and my Twitter of this interesting new kind of movement that I hadn't seen before. And so when it arrived in, in Wellington, in New Zealand, where I'm from, um, I knew that I had to go and, and at least just to, just to see what was happening there. Like I had no intention of participating, but I, I was um, curious, so I wanted to go and have a look. And almost as soon as I entered into that civic square, the Occupy camp we had in Wellington, my, my life completely changed. My perception of myself and my role in the world changed, and my perception of others and, and the role that they have and, and what, they are, what your average citizen is capable of, that completely changed too. And it was, I put it down exclusively down to the methodology, the practice of direct democracy that we were, we were playing with at Occupy. So we had a, a, a shared understanding of there are these massive global challenges that are facing us. And then we would sit in a circle and hear from everyone, one by one, what do you think we should do about it? And how do you think we should, you know, what things should we focus on? What kind of message should we put forward and so on? And the process of participating where, where everyone, well, everyone is expected to contribute and everyone can expect to be heard. Uh, that is a, a, an experience that most people don't get. And the first time I had it, I was, I was addicted and I wanted more of it and I wanted to share it with more people. Um, and, and while that Occupy experience was incredibly liberating and inspiring and exciting, it was also at times um, crushingly depressing because you find yourself in meetings that will last for four or five, six hours and uh, people don't actually really understand each other very well and you have these misunderstandings and conflict and we're all amateurs, we don't know what we're doing, we're making it up as we go along and you get these pointless, pointless debates that go forever and, and, and over the space of, of weeks and then months, our camp, like so many other Occupy camps around the world, really disintegrated into this really unpleasant place. It, it started as this utopia and wound up as this kind of zombie apocalypse. Um, and so me and, and a, a large number of other people, and both in, in the Wellington camp but also around the world, um, were having a conversation about how do we, how do we learn from this amazing and ex inspiring methodology, this practice of direct democracy? How do we get the good bit of that and bypass all of the soul-crushingly boring, slow meetings that never go anywhere. How do we, you know, how do we um, capture the best part of it? And the obvious solution that we came up with was, was to use technology, to, to replace that um, general assembly of, assembly of people sitting together in, in the, have, that have to be in the, the same time and the same place and move it into the online space where people can participate on their own terms, when they've got time, on the issues that they care about. So we got together and we started this project called Lumio. And Lumio, the word, is, it's a nonsense word, but it comes from the idea of a loom, which is uh, an English word for a weaving tool. For, for the idea is that we weave everyone's different perspectives together into some kind of coherent whole. Um, and Lumio is, is a very, very basic, minimal piece of technology. So it's an online discussion forum, and you have a group of people, and they talk about a topic. And anyone in the group can, at any time, 
put forward a proposal and say, I think we should do this, or um, I think, you know, do you agree with this idea? And that's all it does. There's no more to it than that, and I don't want to emphasize how amazing our technology is beyond that. That's it. It's a, it's a discussion, and then there's a decision on the side. And it allows people to um, organize themselves democratically, so anyone can participate, and anyone can um, show that initiative and decide, I, I think we should do this, and then develop a shared understanding behind them. And so immediately, as soon as we had the very, you know, in the first couple of days, we had the, the roughest version of the software running, we started bringing people onto it and, and learn from their real experience of, of how they're using it and what, what is the next thing that we should build, you know, what is the most annoying part of the software and that we should fix tomorrow, that sort of approach. And we were quite surprised, you know, we were coming from this, this activist background, this sort of um, Occupy kind of angry rah, 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 kind of background, uh, we were quite surprised at just how many different kinds of groups of people came to us and said, we need this tool, you know, we need to make decisions together online. Uh, there has to be a better way than all these horrible meetings. So in the last uh, two and a half years, really, that we've been underway, we have been completely swamped with demand from all over the world, from groups, uh, extremely diverse groups. So whether that's um, the city council in Wellington, um, that you know, when we were in Occupy, they were trying to get us off their lawn. Now they're using Lumio to work with citizens to develop their policy. Um, or it's uh, a, a business that has, you know, it's a company with, with uh, offices around the world and the people want to collaborate with each other across different time zones. Um, and of course, many, many different social movements and, and um, political parties, including a lot of the pirate parties as well, Pirate Party India and, and a few others as well. So we've got this, this mass of different kinds of people. And, and one of the things um, that has been a sort of central theme from very early on was, was our community of, of members. Um, they said, you know, we need you to translate this into as many different languages as possible. This new social movement, this new pro-democracy movement is happening all over the world in different ways and we have to, we have to um, make sure that we can deliver this technology into people's own languages. And, and now I think, I think today we're at 30 languages. Um, when I first put the slides together it was 27. It just, it's, increasing very, very rapidly because we've got a massive community of volunteers that are coming in and, and um, every, every time there's a new social movement turn up. So uh, last year there was a student movement in Hungary and then the next day, you know, Lumio is available in Hungarian. Um, and we saw the same thing with the sunflower movement that turned up and then suddenly, all right, someone's finally translated it here into, into Mandarin. Um, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about, about one of the groups that are using Lumio a lot, because I think it has some parallels, perhaps, for what's going on here. So there's an, um, well, the history, I guess, the history of these social movements, it's sort of, it's hard to say exactly when it started. I don't think it ever started at a, a direct point, but about the same time as the Arab Spring was kicking off, there was the, the M15 Indignados movement in Spain. So the indignados, it's a, it's a word that means indignant, which means, you know, angry, like I'm upset. And they, 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 because they were so successful, that was sort of what became the precursor to the Occupy movement, because people in, in New York saw what was happening in Spain and the way that they were organizing themselves and, and occupying their public spaces and said, this is really good, this is really effective, this is a new way of doing things and we're going uh, we're gonna to import it into the English-speaking world and call it Occupy. And subsequently, of course, the Occupy movement has morphed and now we're seeing it in, in, in Hong Kong. And it keeps, you know, re, re adapting and changing its context and, and, and hopefully learning, learning from each other along the way. So the, one of the outcomes of the Indignados movement um, is this new political party in Spain called Podemos. So Podemos means we can. So just that that movement from indignant to we can, I think is, is very instructive. So it starts with, and I think it's very important to start with the indignant, because I'm indignant, you know, I'm angry at the state of the world. And I, I needed first to come together with other people that shared my anger and my grief and express that together and realize that, yes, actually there's many people in my society that are angry and indignant. And then once we've, when, once we've got that sense of um, collective identity, then we can move on to the constructive action of what we can, what are we going to do. So Podemos, they are organizing in, in what they call circles, so they have geographic circles, so all over Spain there are thousands of, of groups that are 
um, oper operating both online and offline. So they have, they have local circles where they'll get together and they'll have general assemblies and they'll work through issues together. And then they'll also have this online component where they're using Lumio as well as a lot of other tools um, to, to facilitate the policy development and the strategy setting and so on for that party. Um, and in addition to the geographical circles, they also have th thematic circles. So um, there might be one that's about if you're interested in economics or if you're interested in transport or whatever, the food system, whatever your issue is. Um, and they, they, they have, I mean, in the last couple of months, they've only been around for nine months, and they've started over a thousand Lumio groups in that time, and all of those groups have been started independently. There's not someone that's, that's set out a card and said, it's, okay, we're gonna, you're going to have to... Um, start this group in this area and you're going to start this group in this area. It's just, it's self-organizing. People are um, coming out and, and doing it themselves. And the reason I'm excited about it and the reason that I point to it now is that this party that's nine months old, this week there was, a, there was an opinion poll that put them as the number one most popular party in Spain, which is a, a, a massive shift of power in a country that has had very stale, very corrupt politics with very antisocial policies for a very long time. And for the first time there, they're seeing this, this new swell of energy that looks like it might shift the balance of power in, in their formal uh, democratic systems. And it's, I think there's a lot for, for all of us to, to learn from what they're doing. And we sh I, want, I want us to look at them closely and, and see how they're, how they're doing it. Um, I wanted to draw some connections between the, the, the different social movements. And um, David already pointed out a little bit, and I wanted to talk a bit more about this idea of power. Um, and one, one definition of power is the ability to act, so the sort of freedom of movement. And um, in, in my story, you know, I started out and I was depressed and disengaged. Um, I didn't have any power at that point. I, I, I had, I, well, I didn't realize I had any power anyway. I wasn't exercising that power. And then when I first had this interaction with this, this different methodology, this participatory way of working, I became empowered, so I discovered that I, I had the ability to act, that I could move, that I could have an influence on the people around me. And then beyond that, there's the next level of power, which is collective power, which is where you get a group of people and they, they choose to harness their freedom of movement together and point it in a, in a direction. And when you look at the world and you see who's powerful, it's the groups of people that are the most coordinated. You know, so... so um, if you think about who are the most coordinated groups of people, it's like armies, states, corporations, religions, these sorts of institutions that are very effective at shaping the world, at, at creating the world in, in the image that they'd like it to be. And they all use the same methodology. They all use a, a hierarchical structure where there's someone at the top and, and usually, usually a man at the top who's, who's telling everyone else what they should do, and then, and then there's a, a very rigid sort of structure for how information is passed around and how, and how uh, control and, and command is passed around. And as we look to new social movements and, and the future of, of democracy, I think we need to be wary of that methodology and that we don't, that we don't adopt it, because I think whoever, whoever adopts that methodology winds up looking the same. It has the same impact. You turn into one of these institutions that is more interested in preserving itself for eternity rather than actually achieving some kind of positive impact in the world. And so we need to, these social movements, you know, we need to be organized, we need to be coordinated if we're going to achieve anything, but I think we need to organize in a new way. And, and that's the, the part of the problem that Lumio is really focused on at, a, at the small scale. Um, you know, our, our effective groups, I guess, are sort of up to the scale of about five or 600 people. Um, but beyond that, there is a, obviously a much larger scale of, of thousands of people, then millions, and then, and then hundreds of millions. And there are other tools around. And um, it, was, it was great, Gregory, to, to hear some of the tools that you guys are experiencing and, and playing with. And there's others around. One that I'm particularly excited about at the moment, I recommend you check it out. It's called Democracy OS, um, which is very large scale citizen deliberation where they take government policies, they translate them into plain language and then they host a, a discussion about, a deliberation about um, how the citizens actually feel about this, this policy as it's going through. And there's many, many more and, and together we're trying to collaborate and, and figure out which part, which part of the problem are we each trying to solve and, and help each other out along the way. Um, 
I wanted to look at this concept of government, um, given that we're at the at the Gov Summit, and I, you know, personally, I started from this position of being quite anti-government. <laughs> that was I was just outside with my fist up and, and being angry at it, um, and and that's sort of my my native place that I live is to be angry at the government, and. Um, in the last couple of years that I've been doing this work and, and meeting with different kinds of people, I realise that there are actually a lot of people in the government that have very good intentions and they are trying to make the world... They have the same, more or less, the same aims that I have. And um, it's, it's important... That one lesson in there for me is, is learning that I have allies in all sorts of different places and that, and that we can... Um, Put the effort in, and, and uh, David was talking about this as well, the big tent idea of identifying uh, who actually has shared aims and, and, and how we can, who, where is the shared understanding, like a little island of agreement that we can get on together and then expand. And, and this idea of government as mass collaboration. Um, in addition to a, being an uh, engineer, I'm also a mus musician. And the, the most um, sublime, euphoric experience I can imagine as a musician is when we have a group of musicians together and we're improvising and we're collaborating and we're, each of us are ex exercise, expressing ourselves with full autonomy and there's no one you know, directing us and saying, okay, now it's your turn and okay, we'll have a trumpet solo and now, okay, a drum solo. No one's directing it. Um, and yet we're still creating something, co a collective whole that, that has its own beauty to it that is far bigger than any of the individual parts. And I like to think about that experience and, and imagine how we could make government behave that way. How could we have a government that is, that is spontaneous and collaborative and, and, and really create space for people to express themselves with their full autonomy and yet still can, can develop some kind of collective motion and, and some shared goals, you know, some, some purpose. Like, what is, what is the government for? It might be a good question that we could start with. Um, I, yeah, I, I guess I, ha I, don't, I don't want to be critical. I, I, I guess I had a um, I have a little bit of discomfort with this whole notion when we're trying to talk about the, the future of government and the future of democracy. I, I feel a discomfort at this very um, the context we're in now, where there's one person on the stage and, and a room full of people that are listening, and, and the sort of architecture of this room suggests that what I have to say is very important. And what you have to say, what you have to do is just listen. And I, I don't think the future of democracy looks like this room, you know. Um, and I, while it might be interesting to hear one person tell a little story about their past experiences, that's not the future of democracy. The future of democracy is, is up to each and every individual in this room and, and what you're going to do when you leave and go back into your community and what kind of change that you want to make um, and, and, and how you want to affect that change. And that for me is... is, is the future of government, the future of democracy. And if you are working on that sort of thing, um, I hope our tool that we're working on can help. And if you are um, doing something that I might be interested in, please do email me. I'd love to hear what you're up to and see how I can help you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. It's a very interesting presentation. Now, we have a little bit of time. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. Because he really doesn't like to say this kind of thing. Okay. 把握时间，谢谢。Hello, all right. Uh, I understand the fact that you're actually suggesting that uh, government is about collaboration. It also assumes that the people actually knows how things work. Uh, unfortunately, a government are not just about serving the people. Okay, they are serving the people in a way, but in many different way. One of the example is diplomacy, whereas it's not so easy for everyone to collaborate. Think about it. Not everybody understands the intricacy of international politics, the rules of UN as treaties, etc. Uh, so, what do you think about people's role in this kind of policy that is not usually covered by the smaller scale of the government? Okay. Uh, another question: How do you how do you deal with trolls in such a system? All right. That's all. Okay. How do we deal with trolls? I do like that question. Um, so Lumio has, has been focused very explicitly on small groups of people that want to work together. And um, it, it's maybe not a very satisfactory answer, but we don't get trolls. <laughs> because, because we create, you create a context, 
this is who the group is, this is what the group is for, this is the kind of behaviour that is, is welcome here and this is what's not. And once you've set that context and you welcome people into it, you find that people behave like adults when you treat them like adults. <laughs> um, and on the, on the question of, of sort of policy and how do you keep people informed about that sort of stuff, I mean, that, that is outside of the scope of what we're working on. We're really focused on looking at these small groups of people, you know, um, hundreds, hundreds of people maybe, or even less, tens, twenties of people, um, that want to collaborate effectively, that want to um, coordinate themselves in a non-coercive way, um, those people that have the best shared understanding and, and the best intent and all, it's very difficult even for them to collaborate effectively. So we've started with how can we get that, solve that problem and make it as easy as possible. And, and hopefully in the process of, of developing that work, we might find some, you know, we might learn some ideas about how to do it at a larger scale. Um, and at the moment we're really just leaving, leaving that problem to other people to focus on because you, as soon as you go large you get all these other kinds of problems and, and we're really focused on let's just do one thing and do it well and, and leave it to others. Yeah, okay. Our Lumio profits. Okay, at the moment, that's a very good question. We're trying to figure that out. So for the first um, year or so, it was a hobby, you know, um, very enthusiastic, idealistic people just um, volunteering and, and, and trying their hardest. So there was no money. And then in the second year, um, we got loans from our family and from our friends so that we could pay a few people just a, a bare minimum um, living wage so that they could keep programming. Um, and then at the start of this year, we ran a, a crowdfunding campaign, an international crowdfunding campaign, and that has raised enough money for us to survive throughout this year. Um, and we're about to run out of money again, which is a really frustrating and, and boring problem to solve, and it's got nothing to do with the problem that I'm excited about, but unfortunately we have to solve it. And so we are pursuing two different strategies at once. One is looking for investment in, in the work that we're doing. And it's a particular kind of investment, obviously. We're, we're not really attractive to venture capitalists because, well, for one thing, the software is open source, so the, the product we're building belongs to everyone, so there's not something they can sell. And number two, we've refused to sell advertising or to harvest your private data, so the, the, you know, that undercuts the profitability. And, and, and the, the second stream we're chasing is we, we do want to be in a position where we are financially self-sufficient. And so we are pursuing a business model where commercial users pay to use the software so that non-commercial users can use it for free. So, for instance, we have the city council in, in Wellington paying us a, subs a subscription so they can use the software, which means we can give it for free to the revolutionaries in Egypt that are broadcasting the revolution on YouTube. So, in the next round, they can support crowdfunding. So, you can support them. Okay. And the last question. Hello. Here. Ah, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any kind of international negotiating meeting using uh, Lumio? Because I, I attend uh, the COP, UNFCCC COP meeting every year, and uh, there were lots of lawyers, and also each government party joined that. Some, so they would not like to use such kind of tools, because sometimes uh, they need some lawyer to identify the word and the sentence. So it's not easy to use uh, this, this tool. They will use uh, paperwork instead and uh, arguing something about that. For example, United Nations, they never have a tool like that. So I'm wondering uh, in the future, uh, maybe Lumio need more mm. example, such like this. We're, we're seeing a lot of, like I say, a lot of different groups and um, we do see like it'll, it'll pop up somewhere and, and people will try it out. And, We've seen people at the UN, we've seen people at, at NASA and you know, all sorts of different groups, are, uh, uh, you know, in, a lot of international sort of science um, communities getting on it and using it as well. Um, but we've found that because, the, the, you know, like I said, it's not just the tool, it's actually about the, the culture of your organisation. And the culture that is embedded into this tool is, is a kind of culture that doesn't sit well with most kind of organisations. And it, and it requires a, a sharing of power. You know, we say um, power with, not power over. And it, it takes a real commitment to sharing power 
if you're going to be an effective user of this tool. So we do see groups picking it up and then sort of going, uh, I'm not sure if I'm actually willing to collaborate in this way. Um, interesting, in the last few days we've seen quite a lot of users from the Taiwanese government, and I don't know what they're doing or uh, what their plans are, but there's been a lot of them, so that's one to watch for the next few months. 好，谢谢，谢谢 Richard， thank you for sharing。呃，大概我们早早上的到这边，然后等一下休息一下之后，最后一个压轴的 panel 这样子，然后。像刚刚他说的一样，公民参与透过网络上面来做，其实最困难的绝对不是科技。透过然后两个国际讲者的分享，我们都知道了。最重要的是 local 的 community 的 mindset 是什么？然后各个 shareholder 之间，你有没有办法克服自己的困难，跟有那个勇气去试看这样新的尝试？那我们最后的 panel 就非常精彩，包括了官方的代表，包括了民间的代表，还有相关的专家，大家一起来谈一谈。透过 GreenV 的努力，还有我们早上看到这些科技的可能性，我们在台湾这个地方要怎么样实现它，以及我们遇到什么样子的困难？那我们保持时间，就是在十一点二十准时开始，请大家准时就位。谢谢大家。